Cool. So we'll go ahead and start with our verbal attendance. Uh, Mike. What? Verbal attendance. Here. Dan. Bree. Here. Naomi. Stephanie. Alan. Chad here. Gabe. Here. James. Here. There he is. Um, Alex. <clears throat> Taylor. And Paul. I am here. Excellent. We only have six counselors here, so we do not meet quorum. Um, we will go to the approval of the agenda. I do want to point out that the agenda that's in front of you is not the one that was initially sent out, so we need to approve this. The change that was made is that Dr. Simpkins is going to be coming from 315 to 345 rather than the previous agenda that said 240. So I propose this change to the agenda as you see it here. Second that. Yeah, we can't vote for it. Yeah. Cool. The agenda's changed. Done. <clears throat> yeah, I think we can vote on business and how the the meeting is set up, even without quorum. We just can't pass any amendments or resolutions. Cool. Um, we will go into updates. Um, Wait. Oh, so are there, there any other agenda items that we would like to change? Okay, because I was thinking, I'm like, if, if there's only six of us here, right? Next, like, and we have three resolutions or uh, resolutions and amendment proposals. Should we even go over them if we're going to go over them again next week when we actually meet quorum to, like, talk about these with our other people and vote on them? Dr. Barone. Oh, no, next week in two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, next week's inauguration. Go ahead. I would, I would support that idea, and we just maybe make a strong recommendation that counselors familiarize themselves with the resolutions prior. I mean, we'll have two weeks to do so. So if we do that, then I'm, I, I would support uh, tabling these. Yeah, so, yeah. So Gabe, was the motion to table these until our next meeting? Yep, until, until our next meeting, and basically today, just have updates. Public comment and Dr. Simpkins. Beautiful. Does anybody second that? Second. Second. Beautiful. And we will vote by opposition. Anybody is opposed to this change of the agenda? Make yourself known. Ta-da. Agenda changed. Um, so items B through D will be tabled till next week, and they'll go into. I think they'll technically be old business at that point. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Here, chat's done. Nothing. Cool. All right. So we'll go to chair updates. I don't have any updates. Gabe, do you have any updates? Um, I don't have any updates either. No updates. Updates. Just great job on a, an awesome election elections team and everybody who ran got over double the voter turnout from last year. We'll go uh, SACAB uh, with Mike. Hello. Good morning. Um, SACAB sort of meted. Um, instead of having an actual meeting, we went and did the creek cleanup that AACP did. Um, all the members, all the voting members except Stephanie were there, so I was happy. Um, and a very good, a very nice congratulations to Gabe and Kristen, who will be becoming the new incoming SACAB reps at MSU. I'm excited. Um, this is two very talented people, and I'm excited to see what they can do on SACAP. So that's all I have for SACAP updates. Beautiful. Gabe, go ahead with trustee updates. Awesome. Okay. So the first update, so um, for the next board meeting, that will be in June. Because there's going to be a lot on the agenda of that board meeting, they want us to do like a one-pager type of report. Um, so if there's like anything anything at all that any one of you wants me to put on it just send me it in a teams message please i'll add it to the little one pager i'll just add it on and congratulations to mike for being now the student trustee elect yay okay and then mike do you have a question yes um 
in terms of um, in the files, do you have any notes by chance like that you can throw in the SharePoint on the, the bot files? Like anything at all from like what you've done, so I can like maybe look at. I have them all written down. Can I, it's okay if I just like scan them. That's perfect. Thank you. Do you? I don't care. Whatever, 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 whatever you need to do. It's all good. <laughs> awesome. And so just to clarify, this one pager that you were referencing, Gabe, um, like what items are they looking for for this one pager? They're just looking for like a report, like any report at all to anything important that we've done, anything important, like one thing I'm gonna put on there is like elections and like the results and all that once all that's like 100% done and dealt with, you know? Um, and I'm also going to just like add like some of the big events that we've done um, and some of the, like the services that we've done, like, like the school supplies drive, the food pantry donations, all kind of like a big summary of, oh, this is what we did this year type of thing. Cool. Go ahead, Paul, then Ree. I'll message you about this, but I'm really proud of this council's work this year on uh, defending our civil rights. I think there's been a lot of different fronts that we've taken up and and pushed through. I mean, hell, um, our advocacy for abortion rights in this state have actually made it through the state legislature onto the governor's desk and have been signed into law. And so, um, you know, we, we played no small part in making that happen. I'm very proud of the work we've done on that front, um, along with the others that we've taken stands on. And I think that should be communicated too. I'll message you about that. No, there were issues with the mics earlier today. Oh, and oh, there, there it is. is. Okay. Yeah, so if you would mi wouldn't mind doing that, Paul, and line iteming each thing, because I know you're you were involved in many of them, most of them. So that would be great and really helpful to Gabe, I'm sure. I'd be happy to do that. Cool. Um, any other updates from Board of Trustees, Gabe? No, no updates, no updates. Cool. Okay, cool. And up next we have budget committee. Hello. Um, yes, so but we didn't meet this week, but we do have a package that's currently up. Um, my intent is to use the rest of the budget committee's budget before the end of the year. So uh, any quality of life things with office that anyone thinks of, let me know. I'm getting us some shelving so we can kind of store a bunch of stuff currently. So anything you, ne um, you need or you think next council could benefit from, uh, do let me know and I will get it. Don't know what the appropriate time to bring this up is, but it has to do with budget. And I'd love to work with you. I know Taylor was interested in this and maybe others that we could um, put ideas together as far as what we'd recommend for salary for next year for the council based on whatever our budget is from SAB, which is, I think, less. And I also wanted to put in um, um, something for the council to consider about something more for the SACAB and um, Board of Trustee reps. That was just what I think is fair based on the amount of time and effort put into the position. Um, you do bring a good point, Ree. Um, I'm going to bring this at some point before the council, but um, we do need to determine next council's pay. Um, that is um, something I'm going to bring up soon, and it might require a constitutional amendment because my plan was to just say, hey, same pay as next year. Um, That's my plan, essentially. But James might have more, the, constitution, the person who wrote the constitution might have more information on that. Go ahead, James. Yeah, a constitutional amendment won't be required. We just need a vote on what it will be. And the, the if we go over a certain amount of our budget requires three fourths, but we won't require a constitutional amendment. It just needs a vote to heighten it, higher it, lower it. As far as I remember, the the budget is based on 40. Per, they cannot go over 45 percent of our of our SAB allocation. Um, but that's gone down. It has. Yeah. So go ahead. So the SAB allocation, it's not that it's gone down. It's that this year coming in, we had a larger rollover. Mm -hmm. 
So the SCB allocation is what I've been told has kind of remained if the institution's enrollment remains at the at the same decline that we had coming in last year, because we're still on a very slight decline. If it remains there, then the SCB allocation shouldn't change, but it is not going up. I can guarantee that. Mike. So, so James, explain. Can you do you mind explaining away the forty nine percent figure in the Constitution? Do you mind like just explaining that because that's where I'm coming from. When like you might need to amend that portion of the document if you want to pay the next council the same as this council. Yeah. So the way I wrote it was no matter what our budget changes to, we can't go over a, that certain percentage. If we do, we just need a vote and have like a good majority of the council to agree upon it. We don't really necessarily need to amend the Constitution because the Constitution already gives us the ability to do it. Um, so as long like if it goes down, the new whatever the 49 percent of the new budget just needs to be voted on to go above the 49 percent. And we already have access to that. We can write in a resolution, but we don't really need to amend the Constitution necessarily. So if I brought a resolution determining next week's or next year's council pay like next week, that's all I need is a vote. I don't need to change nothing. No, nothing in the Constitution because the Constitution allows us to change it. We just need to make sure we have the votes. Okay. That's what's important. Yeah, fair enough. Well, mine's not immediately related to this, but um, some of the folks from the food pantry have asked um, have asked me to um, essentially bring a request to kind of see if we can ballpark um, what it is that might be left over at the end of the year, accepting for the rollover that we'd outlined so that they can kind of work with um, a, a prediction on whether or not they'll be able to use that funding or if it'll complete their necessary funding for the summer's food pantry staffing. They, they plan to have one person running the food pantry and um, they're getting some money from the institution but I believe there's still a bit of a deficit there in terms of um, keeping the food pantry open during the summer. And so um, if, if we could, Mike, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you on this, just kind of seeing if we can ballpark what uh, might be left over at the end of the year so that we can give them a little bit more information to work with, um, give them a more complete picture of what their funding might look like. All right, um, anybody from the Sustainability Committee? No. Well, thank you all anyways for uh, everybody who went and helped with the, the Earth Week cleanup and stuff like that. Thank you all. Awesome. On to the Judiciary Committee. Sweet. Uh, so we did meet yesterday. Uh, Gabe and I did. It was mostly just going over that accountability process document that I had mentioned last week. Uh, the plan is to now I will share that document with everyone, uh, both at this meeting and then I'll share it to our general chat as well and to anyone who's not in the chat i will send you an email basically what i want from this document is just to get everyone's feedback on it so that way i can bring it to the deans next week um have them look over as well and bring our our collective feedback on what we think is right what we think is wrong i've basically made this process off of what has been advised by the dean's office to actually make up for that restorative justice that we have promised at the beginning of the term um so like i said just Read it as you can, give me some feedback, whatever you think you would like to see added or subtracted, and then I will bring that information to the deans um, next week. But yeah, that's pretty much it from judiciary. Awesome, on to uh, public relations. Thank you. Um, we did not meet this week, but um, we're gonna start uh, working extensively on food for finals. Um, so any ideas are welcome. Um, it's about all I got. We're just keeping up our social media presence, and I have a list of stuff that I need to uh, to to share, including like the housing event, the powwow. There's one other item, but I have it written down, so that stuff will be shared. Hi. When are <clears throat> when are you all looking to one update the website with the elections winners? If it hasn't been updated yet and to post them on social media. Are you waiting for them to confirm on Monday? Uh, I'm confused by the question. When, when are you looking to post the election winners? Uh, 
I believe maybe Chad can help me with this, that the individuals have to sign and verify mm-hmm. that they are accepting the position. Yeah. Has everybody done that? Not everyone. Okay. Probably four or five individuals so far. Then I think until we know for certain, like 100% without a doubt, who the incoming council is based on those that paperwork, then I will make... And then, uh, uh, so you're, you're doing a post of the incoming council, not of who won the elections. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's, that's, just that's so the you, best option. So then just so you know, um, I posted who won the election cool. on the MSU website so far. We can change who is going to be on council later. That's no issue. Cool. But just because we had put on our elections timeline that the results will be posted by today. So I wanted to make sure it was posted by today. Okay. I mean, if that's what we said, then I will. I can make that. That's right. That post uh, I had, based off that well, privilege. In later in our meetings, I had Chad, well, you also thought, uh, write up a press release as well of the election results so we can get that out as well later. Cool. Um, and then as far as updating the website with the new council, I think uh, that at the end of May, or at least when this council's last meeting is, if we have like good photos that we can get from the inauguration day as well, and we can use those. Um, and we can use those for uh, updating the website to have it done as early as possible. Cool. Um, we will go to, unless there's any other questions, we'll go to policy advisory with Re. No update this week. And we're going right back to Re with uh, Faculty Student Affairs <laughs> Committee. No update this week. <laughs> First time I've had nothing, both of them. Awesome. Now, on to the Indigenous Student Resource Committee and Paul. Uh, thank you, Gabe. Um, so, uh, I regret to re- report that this is the seventh week where the Indigenous Student Resource Committee has not met. I remember, I, well, I listened to last week's meeting and I missed, unfortunately, and I heard um, a report uh, from our chair saying that we were engaging in a variety of activities. There has been no we. Uh, the committee is not meeting. Um, Everybody but the chair has been excluded from the work in this committee. It's made it, um, it's really impeded the work of the committee as a group. We haven't taken up any of the tasks that have been, um, that were essentially given to the committee in its creation. Um, So I would just request that the Judiciary Committee uh, intervene. Um, In our constitution, it says that the Judiciary Committee will ensure that all committees are active, conducting business and producing results towards the goal of that specific committee. you know, seven weeks in, or se- seven weeks since having a meeting, it's 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 hard. Uh, this is one of the few committees that I'm on, and I really want it to work, and I really want to contribute in a, in any way that I can. But without meeting, we can't. Um, and you know, one person isn't a committee, so um, I request that that, that inter- intercession by by the Judiciary Committee on this issue. Um, I really don't want to see, I had heard last week that there was discussion of removing people from the committee or dissolving the committee. And, um, I feel that to do that would be an undemocratic way of going about, um, handling what is like a problem, um, in the committee. And so, uh, that's all I have to report. I wish I could report that we were doing things, but we're not. Okay. And then back to Paul for the cross functionalities task force. So um, last week I had uh, thrown out some tentative dates for listening sessions on the 18th and the 19th. I hadn't heard back from anyone. When I say that I can't do this alone, I really I mean it. Gang, I, I, I can't do this alone. Um, we need volunteers to help facilitate these listening sessions and we're cutting close to the time where we'll need it. Uh, the 28th is when we're supposed to have this information. I need help reserving the rooms. Um, I would really appreciate some assistance from our advisors on 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 getting a room or a, a place that'll be accessible for students to give us their input. Um, when we pass that resolution supporting the faculty workload reduction, um, that's that's our voice part of this. And I know a lot of us have talked about we need to do more than just have voice on an issue. We need to carry out some actions. This is the action part of it. Um, they're looking for more data to support this decision or find out if it's the right decision to make. The faculty have been heard from. It's the student voice that needs to be heard on this issue. And so even if you disagree with me on a lot of stuff, we can all agree that student voice needs to be heard on this issue. 
um, please get with me so we might be able to conduct at least one listening session before um, that day comes up. Thank you. Chad. Cool. Um, these listening sessions, were they something that the overarching task force like requested that we do? Yes. And is this something that they could have or still can assist us with setting up? Because one week is not a lot of time for a lot of us that are full-time students to set this up. Uh, I understand the frustration with the um, with the last minute nature of this, but I brought it up two weeks ago, um, talked about needing to set these up, um, and then brought it up in my update last week, though I was absent. Um, and so uh, we've had some time to set this up. Uh, now we just are in an unfortunate position to uh, need to do this in a week. And so, um, you know, and I would understand when to cut from two to one with that being the case. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Dr. Burrell? For clarification, is this the faculty workload subcommittee or what committee is this? So this is the what this is essentially that, but it's called the cross functionality task force. And so I get lost in all the different names. Yeah, that there's things, like but, five different names, so I'm confused. Yeah, which one? Uh, so this is about. the this is the cross functionality task force that is tasked with determining student voice, faculty voice, and other like data gathering around the question of the faculty workload reduction. I understand there have been other committees in the past around it, but um, yeah. Does that clarify things at all? Yeah, that okay. does. I mean, I, I can help with getting a room or space, or we could even host it downstairs and CMEI or somewhere. We That's not an issue. What my concern is, is getting students there. So what incentive do students have to get there? And who's going to offer that? Is that coming from the committee? Are they going to feed students? Are they going to give them gift cards? What what's going to happen? Because that it's to Chad's point, like it's going to be challenging anyway, like this close to the time frame. But in addition, if there's no incentive, students won't really show up. I understand entirely, and I agree. Um, given our inability to pass business at today's meeting, um, you know, well, I'll also con give some context that um, Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Parmley, um, who's chair at this point said that if we if we weren't able to get funding together for some coffee or something that uh, she'd be willing to help us with that and so we'll probably take her up on that offer and um, see if we can get some coffee maybe some light snacks to bring some students in post it on the free free food app and um, you know maybe get a post out on the our our social media to try to pull some students in i'm not optimistic about participation but um you know, if we could get some semblance of student voice here, we could fulfill um, fulfill at least partially this ask. OK. You're thinking Thursday. Next Thursday, you said uh, the 27th because you need it by the 28th. Yeah, we need it by the 28th. Um, Thursday would be difficult for me, but I can make it work. OK, well, why don't you and I talk offline and let's figure something out and I'll help with what I can. But. We'll just have to do what we can. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Um, any open floor updates from around the room? Yes, Paul. And then James. Talk a lot if you want to let James go first. You have the floor. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to speak to um, our Constitution for a moment. Um, you know, under Section 2, it says attendance for meetings is to be required by all elected SGT SAC counselors. Notification, notification of absence uh, needs to be sent within 48 hours if possible to notify the council. If there are more than three unexcused absences, then the counselor will be in communication with the Judiciary Committee about next steps. If absences continue, a vote for removal will be brought to the council for review. Um, counselors will provide a minimum of five hours a week in office support or proof of advocacy to work elsewhere. Um, even these meetings count as time in, in addition to committee meetings. Um, this is a section in our bylaws that we are in active violation of, and um, we need to take seriously for to if we're to hold members accountable. Um, 
council member Alan Williams has missed more meetings this semester than he's attended. And I just, I can't, I can't think of a single department in our university that has such lax uh, accountability or such lax attendance policies. I mean, if, we, if I worked in, um, if I, if I did that sort of thing in the campus Starbucks, I'd be fired, you know, and, uh, and we really ought to uh, do something about it if we're to set an example for what the next council should do and in, in, in something something similar happens. I think there's a degree to which um, we're being taken advantage of. So I really, um, you know, it, it, it's the school semester is not over yet. Um, and there's there's still time for us to take action on some of these things. I mean, we really should. James. Uh, actually, a couple things. Well, first, I just want to respond to Paul. Um, all of the unexcused absences have actually been like I've been keeping track of all of them. Uh, they're not going unnoticed. The issue is is exactly kind of why I've made the process of accountability sheet is because there's such a long process for accountability that we were not aware of when we started this and which is why you know i'm bringing this whole thing to the deans and to us to actually create an accountability process um all i can say is from a judiciary standpoint i don't feel comfortable going through with anything right now while this system is still being developed because i don't want to experiment on any member regardless of what they've done however it is still within the power of any council member to take action it's not just judiciary so that's all i can say on that but I will say that I have been keeping track of every violation that every member has made. Um, and uh, like it does suck that I haven't been able to do much. Uh, part of it is because of my injury has kept me out of the loop with everything. But I am developing this process so that next year, you know, the next council doesn't have to worry about, well, how do we go about accountability? They can just focus on, all right, well, this is what we have to do. This is how we get it done. So I do want to apologize on my part for not being able to get this done. But I do also want to say that like it's it's a long process that I'm trying to develop as perfectly and as equal as I can for every council member from this council and to future councils. So that's all I can say on that given topic. Um, as far as my two updates, though, I want to do quickly thank Gabe, Mike, Alan, Taylor, Ree, and Dan for either tabling or helping put up or take down Spring Fling. Overall, I think it was a successful uh, event. We made a lot of connections, a lot of students who were pretty interested in you know, getting involved with TSAC uh, next year. So that is pretty exciting. However, I am just a little disappointed by the lack of counselors who did show up for tabling. I do know many of us have, you know, other organizations we are a part of but you know it's hard for us especially me because at one point it was just me sitting there and it's hard for me to say we're your student government when it's just me um so i i know that a lot of us are busy but it is a four-hour event i'm sure there can be at least one time throughout those four hours where we can take 15 minutes to go and table meet and connect the students um but yeah it, it's just a little hard but i am i am proud of those people that did show up um, even if it was for 15, 20 or an hour, um, however long you did come. My second update is I am a little worried because next Friday is inauguration. And since we don't have quorum today, we cannot amend the Constitution to fix the issue of inauguration day. I know it's technically a technicality, but I don't know if there's a way we can do like an emergency meeting regarding that or if we're just going to ignore it. I don't really know how we want to address that, um, but that's pretty much all I have. Question, James, what is the issue with Inauguration Day? Um, the Constitution, as I put it, mostly because this is how I've always considered Inauguration, is that is the end of the, the current council and the beginning of the next. Mm. So if we go ahead with Inauguration next Friday, from a constitutional standpoint, it would be the end of our term and the beginning of the next council, um, which is why we were hoping to pass this amendment that Taylor and I worked on today to get that fixed and switch it over just to a, a June 1st. Um, but that's my only concern that I have. I do. Oh, we're going to go to Paul. Go ahead. Good. Uh, just a quick point of clarification. I was among those who helped table <laughs> yesterday. I know I wasn't present at the table for a long time. I'm one of those who have other organizations um, that I work with. Um, but I was there in the beginning to help set up the tent to help bring down some of the swag. Um, I'll be at a small, small participation. I just wanted to have it noted that I too participated. Well, thank you, Paul. I didn't, I didn't see it there because I came in that early, but thank you. 
we'll go to Mike if you have a super quick update, and then we'll go to public comment. Hey James, so can we do it like a like a Roadrunner link poll? Because um, that's how they did. That's how they how they did it to change elections code. You just need to get two thirds to vote on that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I mean, as long as I don't. I mean, I personally don't see any issue as long as we get the votes. But I don't know if that's an issue regarding having a vote outside of a meeting. That is something that we can do. We just have to share the results of that vote in our next regular meeting. Okay, then I will get the link made and the poll set up probably uh, either today or Monday. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we're going to move to public comment now. If you're a member of the public in in like in person, let yourself be known if you want to make a comment. If you're online, put your name in the chat that you're here for public comment as well. All right, we got Mr. Will that's going to take a, a few seconds. Oh, uh, maybe more than a few seconds, but uh, I'd like to congratulate every counselor that is present and not present for uh, running and uh, winning. So, Ray, congratulations, Paul, Gabe, and Mike. Congrats. That's it. All right. Any other? public comments that would like to be made. We're going to go once, twice. All right, well, 3 to 3.15 is still time for public comments, so if you do show up during that time, please let us know, and that is your time to use. Um, any other open floor updates? All right, next item of business, advisor updates. Let's start with Dr. Barone. Uh, I would like to echo the congratulations to everyone um, who was elected into their positions, those who are, um, everyone who ran. I know it's a lot of work and it's um, a commitment. So just want to say congratulations to everyone for running and um, to those who will be continuing in new and different roles um, and looking forward to working with the new group and hoping that things will be a little bit easier <laughs> this next year. Um, as some things have been ironed out and established, but also want to remind you all that things do take time. And I know while your terms are for one year, there's always someone coming after you. And so this is what I tell people all the time. It's important to trust the process, right? And it's not just getting to the goal of what you're trying to achieve and the outcomes, but trusting the process and how you get there and making sure that it's a, um, a process that has integrity and um, all of those other things that you all talked a lot about when we talked about values are really important to just keep your eye on um, as you are establishing this new um, form of shared governance because it, it's going to take time. So just be patient with the process and patient with yourselves. And um, I want to thank James specifically and, and that committee that I know has gone through some challenges because of, of the challenges and the barriers and the systems that we work within. But um, I just want to encourage you all to trust the process as we continue to move into the next year and we'll continue to build, right? So you all will continue to build it out and make it strong. So just had to say that. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to remind you all about is Inauguration Day. Um, so uh, Taylor sent out an invite. Um, so it should be on everyone's Outlook calendar. Some folks have accepted, most folks have not replied. Um, so just asking if you all can please um, put your RSVP down um, for that uh, inauguration event next Friday. For those who are continuing, it was um, indicated and those who are online and new counselors, um, it, it was listed as a mandatory event. So we're expecting you all if you are a new counselor um, because it is part of um, just what an expectation is. Gabe, do you have a question? Yes, question. So that day is also the undergraduate research conference. Oh. And if I have to present for the undergraduate research conference, can I leave early? Yes, that's an extenuating circumstance. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, inauguration day. Um, one of the pieces that we included on the agenda is um, we would like 
um, the current council to offer um, your reflections, um, proud moments or words of wisdom that you would like to offer to the new council. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a preview there and give you some things to think about. Um, and then the other thing I also wanted to talk about is the uh, survey for Native Indigenous students. Um, we piloted it uh, this last week with three students for them to give us input and feedback for improvements. Um, they thought it was really great. Uh, and so we're ready to send it out. Um, been working on that this week. It will go out hopefully Monday by noon. But I remember the incentives conversation we had here about a month ago and um, the Center for Equity and Student Achievement will be purchasing those, but I do need them. I need to know what we're purchasing again, because I didn't have it, and it's probably somewhere in the chat buried, and I don't want to go through that thing. So if someone, please, can please spare me that experience and uh, send me whatever those, that incentive package was that I need to make sure to um, offer to the students through, we're going to do like a random drawing for students who participate. Um, I really need that um, so that we can get moving on that. And then the other thing um, I wanted to talk about was the Provo search. Um, here's another opportunity where we have been asked to um, facilitate a listening session um, with the Wit Kiefer, who is the firm who will be uh, recruiting for the next provost. Um, and Based on our schedule uh, over the next few weeks, I have taken the liberty of scheduling a day and time because there's just too much going on, as we all know, um, and hoping that as many of you can attend as possible. Um, we're looking at May 5th from 1 to 2.15. We're going to offer lunch, so it would be before this meeting, um, and it won't just be for TSAC. OK, like this is for any students who want to participate in offering input and feedback to who our next provost should be or what qualities are important to folks um, and to students, especially in looking at our new leader for academic affairs. It's an important it's like this, the next important position to the president. So I highly, highly recommend um, if you all uh, have a lot of thoughts and feelings and input about the the academics and the curriculum and majors, minors, all of those things, um, you know, and, and just your academic experience that you participate in that if you can. Um, and hoping for a confirmation on that, but more to come on that. And I will send out calendar invite. Feel, feel free to forward it to whoever you think might be interested in attending. And I will do the same on my end with my different circles. That's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Huh? What? Oh. <laughs> um, so for my updates, I wanted to reiterate that um, the Student Affairs Strategic Planning Committee has a couple different focus groups focused on different parts of the strategic plan. I sent out uh, the student engagement portion, and then I believe Re sent out the faculty portion. There's a couple different parts and they kind of got bombarded all into one email. I wanted to reiterate if we could please get those in. I had the deadline of for Monday and I've gotten no responses at all. This is something that was on y'all's goals of helping out the strategic plan. This is the opportunity. Don't not do your goal. One, two, um, congratulations again on everyone who did run, everyone who ran or everyone who ran, everyone who won the elections and just just for the participation and commitment to trying to serve the larger student body. It doesn't go unnoticed. Um, we can say that all the time and it may sound cliche, but we do want to applaud everyone who did run um, because it's it's great. Um, I'm proud we beat our realistic goal of uh, doubling our elections results from the last two years. We had a record of 311 votes, uh, 309 and then two paper ballots. So we are taking all things into consideration for next year's elections and prepping them to run better, run smoother, run more efficient. Um, other than that, I think that's really it that I have. I'm trying to think if there's any larger items. Nope, that's all, thank you. Okay, awesome. And now elections with Chad. Um, just echoing Armando, all that good stuff. Um, then, uh, uh, 
I'm going to be working on a write up of exactly how um, all of the votes were counted and tabulated and how everything went down and who got elected. Um, I'm going to hold off until the 24th. Um, right. Anyway, I'll be putting it out next week uh, uh, regardless. So you'll be able to see that. Um, the actual results will only be available to view until the 28th uh, through the website. Um, but that's something we can't really control. That's the third party software we use. But hopefully the write up will be sufficient for any questions of how the votes were counted. Um, if anyone's interested, I can go over verbally uh, with y'all because I have them right here. Um, then on the only other thing that I have on my plate is going to be working on a manual for future elections managers uh, to come in uh, and hopefully still run the process. And then secondly, I'm going to try and email uh, a lot of, if not all of the people who voted and like come up with a survey on if the, you know, if there's something they would like to see in an improvement in the ballot. Um, and then on top of that, um, maybe we'll see, but maybe it'd also be nice to try and connect with students and be like, did you know we had elections, et cetera, et cetera, and try and use the remainder of our swags and stuff to uh, get that survey going. So I think that's all I have, oh, except I got a sick new tattoo. <laughs> my election update. Not pertinent to elections. Thank you, Chad. All right. Um, let's let's take a quick four minute hiatus while we wait for uh, for Dr. Simpkins. So rally back at three fifteen. Test, test.
All right, welcome back. That was the quickest hiatus ever, 315. And uh, Dr. Simpkins, welcome. You have the floor. Hi. This feels very like, Hi. am I in front of Congress? <laughs> Are you about to? No, you, did, you didn't subpoena me to get me here. I just showed up. All right, Mike. Um, and James and Kenny are online. Cool. Um, so I wanted to say, uh, good to see all of you. Congratulations on running an election. I know that's not easy. Who was the election manager this year? Well done. Well done. Nicely done. Um, did we get our vote? How many people? 311. I think that's like 500 times better than that. <laughs> So um, uh, it could be a lot better. We got a lot of room to grow, but uh, we, we perfect, perfect, awesome. That's what I love. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to Naomi, who sat in, represented y'all on President's Cabinet yesterday. Um, she did a great job. Uh, uh, it was good to see her there. And I just, um, I think overall, thank you for showing up to those meetings. It's been really great not to see. Um, the same person every time, but to actually see multiple of you coming through, it means the university community is getting to know more of our student leaders, and I, I just really appreciate that. Um, it's that time of year where it's like we're getting to the end, and I start getting nostalgic about where we've come and how far we've been, right? You're just like, elections are done, we're done, let's move on. Um, so let me quickly give you um, some updates on the Student Affairs Strategic Plan. And then um, I've got a couple of questions that I'll throw out because I'd love some feedback. But as always, I know you will interrogate me as, as you um, desire. So uh, our, the, the university strategic plan is our ultimate goal setting document. That is the big, the big P, big picture, big picture vision for university. Right now we're setting the metrics for that. One of those sort of the, the top level metric will be about increasing our graduation rates. And Gabe got a, um, a lesson in that during the advisory board meeting today. But essentially our four year graduation rate right now is 12.3%. So of students who start here as freshmen, not transfer students, and who start full time, not part time in their first semester, only 12.3% of them will graduate in four years. It goes up to about 25% in six years. And so um, our goal is actually at least a 30% four year graduation rate by 2030, because 30 by 30 just sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> it, it is aspirational. It's gonna, we're gonna have to do a lot of really hard work um, to meet that, right. but a lot of institutions have done it, so we feel good about it. So as you think about the student affairs strategic plan, just know that everything in our strategic plan for our division speaks to the university strategic plan. This is part of the university strategy, but not the complete university strategy is what I'm trying to say. Um, we have five goals. Each goal has a working group made up of one lead facilitator from the division and five or six other staff members, some who have deep knowledge of what they were talking about, some who are innocent bystanders who wanted to learn and wanted to get involved. Um, our first goal is to create and utilize data informed strategies to identify priorities and make resource allocation decisions. What that really says is, do we have a strategic plan? Is it guiding how we're spending our money? And how are we measuring our success? So some of the work that that team has done in is, there's a group right now called DIGIT, which is, stands for something about data governance. I don't actually know what the other two I's and the T stand for. Um, so, that is to provide specific definitions to terms and metrics that the university uses to measure certain things. So what is a graduation rate? What is a retention rate? What is a persistence rate? What is a GPA? How are we measuring those things? And are we using the same data definitions that academic affairs is using and are what we're all using standardized across higher ed? Um, another part of what they are working on is how we collect data. So, um, most of you probably don't go into an office and tap your ID card to say, I was here, not yet. We are getting there. Campus Rec has that. The C2 is about to launch it. Uh, that might be it. That might be it. So what we'd love is 
you know, when I talk to a department and say, how many unique students did you serve last year? Probably about two thirds of my departments can't answer that question. So if I wanted to say what percentage of the student body is using, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a department, I don't know. Who? The LGBT Center, that's a great one, thank you. Um, then they can't answer the question. They can tell me how many students came to their events and they can add all those numbers together and say, well, we impacted, we had you know 3,000 student visits, but that could be five students visiting hundreds of times each, or that could be 3,000 students. So we don't have the, the infrastructure to collect a lot of that data. That's another part of what they're working on. Our second goal is to close retention equity gaps. And that does, if we close the retention equity gaps, then that also helps our completion equity gaps. Right now, our Latino students are retaining at the same level as the university average. Our black students are about 12 percentage points lower. Um, and I made this really clear in, in our advisory board. We are not putting the blame on the students for that. This is not about students not doing something that they should be doing. This is about we have created a system riddled with inequities that is producing outcomes based on those inequities. And so we have to fix that. Um, and so a lot of that work, uh, they are looking at, are we disaggregating all of our data? So if we know how many students are doing study abroad, do we know how many Latinx students, how many black students, how many API students, how many first gen students? I told a story that at my previous institution, we knew what percentage of our students were doing internships and it seemed like a great number until we realized that for an institution that was 75% students of color, something like 80% of the students doing internships were white. And so clearly there was a problem in the structure of the program. And so disaggregating data is a really uh, key point of this. Um, other parts of this are looking at a dedicated first year experience whether that's a seminar or some sort of orientation program that will allow students to meet each other, build community, build cohorts with shared identities, specifically tailored to BIPOC students in that um, first year, because uh, we lose about 42% of our first year students. They don't make it to the second year. Um, we're also looking at how can we continue to support the work of student organizations, and um, programs like the Native Indigenous Program Support, where we have a full-time staffer who's doing things in addition to what NISA is working on and working with NISA. That's sort of where we'd love to be in the future for a lot of, of other student populations. It's just a matter of resources um, uh, and dollars. But how can we do that without dedicated full-time staff? Can we work together across units to create some of that? Um, and then another goal that they're talking about is how do we work with our academic advisors to make sure that they're culturally competent, that they're aware of what some of the needs of our BIPOC populations might be and what might prevent a BIPOC student from utilizing academic advising or asking the right questions, the right questions in heavy quotes. So that's our retention gap area. Third goal is increased student uh, engagement overall. And so uh, we've, in that group, we've talked about using data. So if we know that Chad who's an entering student is interested in um, very bright ponchos. Can we connect Chad with the very bright poncho club before he starts on his first day of classes? So on first day of classes, August 21st, 2023, he knows there's a gathering for bright poncho wearers at the Tivoli that he can just sink right into, right? right. So can we collect data from students? A bright poncho club would be great, don't you yeah. think? Done. Done. When I was a student, we had wear jeans if you're gay day as a way to like raise um, uh, 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 visibility of our LGBT groups. I have never seen so many cowboys in khakis before. Uh, it was great. Um, uh, yeah. So um, another strategy is um, making it easier for students to navigate the university and identify the right resources based on their interests. Right now, you probably know our websites are terrible. They're they're so dysfunctional. They don't speak to each other, and you we don't communicate with you very much about how to use the resources that we have. So that's number two. Um, our fourth goal is reducing or eliminating student housing insecurity at MSU Denver, and so this is our metrics are actually really clear on this one. 
We participate every other year in the Real College Survey. The last data from 2021 said that 51% of our students who responded experienced housing insecurity in the last year. We'll run that survey again in fall 23, and that'll be our third year, third iteration of that survey. So we'll be able to see what the trends look like. Um, this was also, this was down from 60 some percent in 2019. I do think the money that was available to lots of students and lots of people during COVID actually reduced some housing and security issues. And so I'll be curious to see what happens in 2023. But we'll also look at the number of care center referrals around housing and security and emergency funds that we're spending, emergency grants on housing. So they're gonna look at things like, can we support the transition from K-12 to higher ed around housing and make that really easy? Can we prevent eviction by providing low or no cost um, legal services on campus, get students connected to housing um, attorneys? Um, we're working with the Denver Housing Authority on potentially having vouchers that we can give out directly to students. We do a lot of work with landlords, particularly the student housing landlords. And then of course, we would love to build student housing. We just don't have the money. So if anybody has 30, 40, 50 million, you got it? No, okay. But if uh, you do, just know that it is something we would love to do. The partnership with CU Denver is working marvelously, except we only have 150 beds there. But we, whatever, however many beds CU Denver gives us, we will always fill. And our last goal is becoming a best place to work for our staff. The more staff sticks with us, uh, doesn't you know get a job for a year and then leave, the better your experience is because you work with the same people over four years. And so that's what we're aiming for. Happy staff equals happy campus. So our four areas that we're talking about are compensation. Um, we've talked before about the living wage initiatives that we've done in student affairs. So I'm really proud now that no one in student affairs makes less than 44,600 and embarrassed that that's our number because that's a low number. Um, we're gonna run another exercise this year to try to get that up a little further but I'm not sure what the number will be. We're also looking at things like providing salary supplements for Spanish speakers so that we know who our Spanish speakers are in specific offices so that we can um, compensate them for that labor that they're doing and that skill that they have, um, but also be a little bit more intentional about if a student needs a Spanish speaker, we know where they are and can find them. So make that less of an informal arrangement and more of a formal arrangement. And as the president said, if the military can do it, why can't we do it? You're a veteran, right? That's why I pointed at you. Okay. If you weren't a veteran, I was gonna be really embarrassed. Um, we're talking about leadership development, talking about work-life integration, things like living our alternative work arrangement um, policy. And that doesn't mean somebody wants to work four days a week from home, so they get to work four days a week from home. Because when you walk into an office, there still has to be vitality and you have to be able to get your, your resources that you need access to. I don't want you walking into dead offices because everybody's working from home. And I think actually that's where we are with a lot of our units right now. So it's finding the right balance between the flexibility to work from home occasionally, to change your schedules, and still maintain the physical spaces that we need um, to serve you. So let me stop there. I have some overarching questions, but what questions or feedback do you have? Yeah, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Simpkins. <clears throat> um, I have a few questions here, but I'll just do this one. So um, there's kind of a rumor around that um, MSC Denver and a lot of other schools got denied money from the state. Um, I believe mm -hmm. Richard asked the state for money. And um, the MSU currently is in a big deficit of money at the moment. So what is the university, because I mean, it feels like a tuition increase is coming. It yeah. feels like an intuition, like not necessarily for the people who have tuition lock, mm -hmm. but I feel like that's going to be a, an issue coming up that the board of trustees is going to have yeah. to handle. So what does that look like from your arena? So a couple questions before I answer. Yeah. You all have a representative on the university budget committee now, right? Who is that rep? That's you. And are, are you able to go to the meetings and be in the conversations? Sort of. They're, okay. they're really poorly timed for a student, so I make it when I can. Noted and agreed 100% with you. If you can't go, I think you, you should send a stand in because um, this is the time of year where the budget starts to move really fast because the board will need to approve our university budget on June the 2nd. 
And so that means if TSEC has a position, SG TSEC, on the budget, make sure that, uh, will it be Gabe or will it be, it'll be Gabe. Make sure that Gabe knows so that when the board votes, your perspective is on the table about the presentation that's going before the board. Now, um, it is not true that we got cut by the state. It is true that we did not get what we asked for, but what we asked for was also more than the governor wanted to give us. So we got more than the governor wanted us to get, but less than we wanted to get, thanks to our legislators on the Joint Budget Committee. So um, it will represent, I believe, about a 13% increase for MSU Denver, if I've got those numbers correct. Um, and uh, with that revenue coming in. So what we do is there's two steps in the funding formula for how money goes into higher ed in the state. Step one is um, your mission and role. And that's where the percentage of first gen students, the percentage of students of color, of Pell eligible students, the more Coloradans you're serving, the, the higher number you're gonna get from that. So if money goes into step one, we do very well. Step two is the other stuff like how many students you enroll, period, what's cost of living where you are. So that's the one where we don't do as well. Um, so Boulder would like all the money to go through state step two. We would like all the money to go through step one, just to give you a sense of how that plays out. So we got a lot of money into step one this year. So we felt really good about that. And thanks to, I believe, someone from student government or a student went up. Uh, yeah, James did a phenomenal job talking about the university. Um, we are in a place, though, where we have a lot of staff and programs that are funded on one-time dollars. So that's HERF money that will run out in the next couple of years. Uh, that's the federal dollars or um, grants or rollover money at the university. And so we're going to need a plan into the future on how we fund those. That's the hole that you're talking about. Um, we're not at a point where we're doing budget reduction exercises like CU Denver and Regis are doing right now, if you've been reading the news. Um, we did tap into our reserves this year to make some strategic investments and in things that we that we thought would pay off. And they did pay off. Our recruitment has been up 5% in the fall, another 5% in the spring. That's new full um, uh, degree seeking students. If you include concurrent enrollment in that, we were actually up 20% on new students in the spring. So really happy about that. Um, but a lot of work to do around retention still. Um, did I answer your question? I got lost there. Uh, yes. The only other part left was um, the possibility because it was just a rumor. Uh, tuition. tuition. Um, so we know what it's going to cost to run the university. There are some new money budget asks that are on the table that up back the university budget committee was looking at this morning of different scenarios to budget uh, to balance that. So to balance our budget, we know how much money we get from the state. We make some enrollment projections that are usually pretty spot on in terms of are we going to be 1% up, 1% down. I think right now we're looking at like 2% down overall, um, which I hope we're going to do better than that. But I'd always rather project conservatively. And so then we have to look at both for our fee funded programs and our tuition dollars. Do we need to increase that to balance the budget? The governor has given uh, or in the long bill, I believe we have permission to increase tuition 5%, up to 5%. Last year it was up to 3%, I believe. But remember, for everyone in this room, your tuition won't go up because you're in the tuition lock. And so the increased tuition is only for new students coming into the institution. So now all of you in this room should be able to plan your tuition. Uh, if you're a transfer student, I think it was three years. If you're a first time student, you get four years um, and then we grant. Um, we did all the work for those of you who were already students last year when we did that. So again, it's only new students coming back in the institution that would pay the increase. So up back is where the word will start of what we're considering as a tuition increase, and that'll be considered by that advisory group to advise the senior staff and the president on what the reaction to that is and how to think about that. So that's why it's really important that your representatives be in that room. And then fees, just as a policy matter, 
Um, we can increase fees without a vote by the students if it is lower than the rate of inflation. Right? So um, AHEC is likely raising their fees. I've heard 8% because that's less than inflation, but 8% equates to, I think it was like $11 a student for a full-time student. Um, that's what the increase would be, the total increase would be. No, that's total. For like somebody taking 12 credits, it would be an increase of $11 or $12. I will get you specific numbers and send them to Armando to get to you, both on the, the long budget bill and the money that came from the state and the AHEC numbers. I'll make sure you get those. Um, we typically look at 5% for the student fees, so the campus rec, the wellness fee, the student affairs fee, because um, I think in 2010, the university, when the state did cut higher ed spending, the university moved a lot of staff onto fee funded lines instead of state funded lines. Uh, and so we have a ton of personnel that are paid for by fees. And so to make sure that we're able to give people raises, cover the cost of benefits, cost of living things, we have to we have to step that up. I believe you're an example of someone who is completely paid for by fees. Okay, there you go. Oh, he's not. Oh, right, for the ethical reasons. Love it. Sometimes I do things right. Thank you. Great. I wanted to ask um, how the board and the president feel about uh, corporate partnerships and sponsorship, financial sponsorship, yeah. and things like that. We love them. You do. Uh, we do. So uh, the technical on that. term is P3, as you know, from your New Zealand experience. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, our AES building is, is really the statewide model of P3 partnerships, or I guess that's redundant, in higher education. Yeah. Because the equipment on the first floor is all sponsored and funded by major corporations. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth floor uh, are corporate tenants who pay rent to be in the building, which allows us to pay the bond payments on the building. And built into their lease agreements are student internships and opportunities for students to learn. So we love it. And in fact, around housing, what we'd like to say is we have the land. We have the people who will live there. We need the money. And so if you've got the money and we don't have to pay for it, like, let's make a deal on housing. And you do like naming rights and Absolutely. things like that. OK, Absolutely. I'll name anything that sits still. OK, I love it. Including I, I, myself. I agree. <laughs> you don't sit still, though. <laughs> well. What else? Can I call on Paul? I don't Thank know what you. I'm allowed to do. Um, so I, uh, I think a little uh, about a month ago, I sent um, an information request regarding um, black student enrollment, retention, and academic success. Um, I just wanted to just look at that. You didn't get anything back. Uh, nothing written. And okay. So I did get an email um, about um, you know getting a time that would work for you to come come speak to us about that. Honestly, I understand you're a busy guy. Um, and so even if we can just get some of those questions yep. answered in writing, it would be uh, yeah. really informative of our work going into the next Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I'm, I will follow up with why that didn't happen, but we will get you some stuff. The high level is MSU Denver educates more black Coloradans than any other institution in the state by far. Uh, 1,200 of our students identify as black or African-American, about 1,200. Um, the next closest institution is CU Denver with about 600. Boulder and Fort Collins um, educate about 500 each, and the numbers go down from there to the School of Mines, which enrolls about 50 out of their entire population. Now, remember, Boulder, 30,000 undergraduates, 500 of them are Black. So we feel really good about the pattern of Black students enrolling at MSU Denver and choosing MSU Denver. But like I said, our retention rates are down and our graduation rates are down. So we're doing something wrong. In Colorado, yeah. Just take the floor. Yeah, yeah, I was about to be like, I'll just take it. Uh, I, um, I've been kind of tossed around the idea internally and I talked to Mike a little bit about it, but if it would be any help, um, I know it's my understanding we have a, like a lobbyist 
in, mm-hmm. in the state legislature. Yep. If we were to develop a committee in this next year that worked to have like a closer relationship with our state legislature or our representatives there right. and um, maybe add more student voice and like a like a maybe a physical person um, and yeah. where we could, um, you know, work to bring in students that are affected by the way our institution is historically un- underfunded. Um, I'd be happy to work with you on that and um, if that'd be helpful at all. And yeah. Uh, have you all had Casey Gerhart come in to a meeting and just talk about our legislative strategy? I don't um, believe so. She's a executive director for government affairs for the university. She's also awesome and one of my most favorite people in the world. She's also very good at her job. Uh, she's been with us for two years now. We've had, or three years, three record years of legislative um, investment in the university. So after this legislative cycle ends, have her come in when she actually has time in her day and talk about how we move the needle. But she, I know, is a huge fan, as are our lobbyists. Whenever we can get a student in front of the legislature, slam dunk. Like James, slam dunk. Um, Your voices are much more powerful than our voices in that room. And so, yes, please. Happy to do that. And thank you for taking the time to be here. Sure. Can I call on James? Who's mending my time? Well, you've got to cut me off at some point. Okay. All right. Well, I have a meeting at 345, so I will step out in just a couple minutes. James, my friend. Uh, I was just going to quickly point out that I am all, uh, in contact with Casey. I was going to have her come on sometime this semester, but unfortunately, I took the fall and broke my leg. So... I've been just out of everything, but I will try to get that contact to Paul as well. So that way he can also be in connection with her and help bring her on to TSAC next semester. Awesome. You're just a mess, James. You got a broken leg, you got a cold. Come on. (laughs) My bad. Cool. So to respect your time, I guess we'll go into closing thoughts. Any uh, final questions for Dr. Simpkins from anybody? But this is something that I've kind of been tossing up how I'm going to try to do, but um, I've taken real issue with students being on boards at this university and on this campus without having any voting power. Um, this is true in a board board, where board directors. We have our representative on there and she gets kicked out of executive session and does not get a vote. And that has happened way too many times for me to kind of be all right with it. And this is the same for a I believe. I don't believe you don't get the next ABOD trustee is me and I don't get a vote on that board. Mm. And this is, this is other institutions in the country get a vote. I mean, it's, I know Ocara does a little differently, but this is one of the issues I want to take up with Casey. This is something the state legislature, I believe has to change. Um, but that's, I mean, I have two more years left at MC Denver. Yes. That is, um, something I'm going to try to tackle in this next year. Sure. Yeah. The, the, um, Auraria, so the AHEC boards and our board of trustees are designed by state law. And so to, to and, uh, and the faculty senate has been interested in like their faculty trustee being a voting member of the trustees. That's a state uh, law issue. Um, our faculty senate has purview over academic policy and curriculum decisions. And I know that's something y'all have been interested in about um, voting rights as well. I think that would be a good conversation for your leaders to have with their leaders. Um, they're doing their election next week, I believe, um, to have a conversation with. I think any conversation where we reflect on our shared governance ideals and operations and strive toward a more perfect shared vision and shared operation in the university is a productive conversation. So bring it on. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to thank you for how closely you worked with us, Dr. Simpkins, this this year. Um, just as a student who um, uh, has had a lot of conversations with administrators and stuff, oftentimes we can get the I see you, I hear you talk, and, if, and it often rings a little hollow, mm-hmm. but you have always been consistent in actually seeming to see us and hear us, and it, and it hasn't felt very hollow. You... you um, and I thank you for that and for showing up at, um, I think it's been like three three of our, our meetings. Um, it's really appreciative. I, I, I'm really appreciative of, of, of you having done all that. And 
So I hope you stick around. Yeah, not going anywhere. Thank you very much. Cool. I'll let you get to your meeting. Thank All you right. so much for coming Thanks. in. Have a nice weekend. Will do. You as well. All right, friends. That is the last item of business that we had today. So thank you all. Have an awesome weekend and be safe. Make good choices if you choose. Don't forget the dance on Saturday, 6 p.m. Um, show up. Oh, at the secret ball. <laughs>